Hello and uh, welcome to today's iCentity Connect webinar. Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us today. Um, and I'm Marianne Comfren. I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases based in London. Um, and we're going to focus today on a, some really exciting and fundamental research um, on vectors. Now, when it comes to vector-borne diseases, it's often said that there are still considerable gaps in the basic knowledge of these vectors, uh, whether in terms of morphology, ecology, behaviors, etc. And alongside of that, there's also, um, we keep hearing about this real shortage in, in skills and capacity in vectors and vector control. So um, today it's my huge pleasure and huge honor to welcome um, Florencia Campitella. Florencia, a very warm welcome to today's webinar. Um, you are with the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, um, based in Germany. You're um, Argentinian, I believe, and you've got a lot of experience and nearly a decade of work um, working with insects and in insect neuroscience for the last eight years. Um, so for today's Connect, you're going to introduce us and take us through some of your uh, ongoing research. We're going to be looking at um, some of your work comparing the olfactory system of Chagas disease vectors um, and in, in a work that's been recently in PLOS NTDs. Um, olfactory behaviors are really critical and necessary um, for infection. And there is such a strong connection between odorants, behavior, infection, that this seems to be a very crucial component of um, the disease cycle, but at the same time, vector control and disease control. So without any further delay, Florencia, I'd like to hand over to you. We can't wait to hear more about this hugely important and really interesting topic. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and I'll uh, hand over to you to share your screen and present some of your work and following that, of course, dear attendees, as you know, we'll have some time for a discussion and for some of your questions. So uh, as soon as you've got a few to, to post, please do go ahead and post that in, in the chat for us. First, many thanks to Marianne and the whole International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases for the invitation to present my work um, that I did during my PhD studies here at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, where in one of my projects, I worked on Chagas disease vectors. So I was interested in compare how does, how is the olfactory system of different species of Chagas of vectors. And first, for those of you who are not familiar with Chagas disease, and I think it's a good reminder since it's a neglected disease, it's always good to put it a bit forward. Um, so Chagas is also known as American trypanosomiasis and is currently affecting 8 million people worldwide. And according to the World Health Organization, 25 million people are at risk and around 10,000 people die every year of it due to complications associated with it. It is endemic in primarily in Latin America where it's usually lack of access to proper housing and hygiene, uh, lack of proper hygiene conditions, which really play a significant role in the spread and, and getting the disease. And it is a top priority, probably next to Corona at the moment, but uh, for the World Health Organization. And there are currently two drugs to treat it. Um, it is a chronic disease and it is actually curable if it is detected early, which seldomly occurs because people usually go consult a doctor when it's already too late. For us and for today, it is important to note uh, that is, disease is transmitted by these insects that are called triatomines. So the etiological agent, so this disease is called is caused by a protozoan that is Trypanosoma cruzi, and it is through the feces of this insect uh, that the protozoan is spread. So basically, this insect feeds on blood, so it has vertebrate host from which they take their blood meal. And as soon as they finish feeding, usually what happens is that they deposit their feces on the skin. And people usually they wrap since 
these insects are active at night, people are sleeping and they wrap their skin and the feces get in contact into the damaged area and they get infected with it. When it comes to the insects, these insects, these blood-hitting insects that are called triatomines, belong to a bigger group of red insects. Um, and that we see here, I think you can see my arrow, I hope you can see my arrow. Um, and what is interesting about triatomines is that they derive actually from predatory insects. And this trait, hematophagy, appeared several times within this family both in contrast to insect, uh, to other insects, blood feeding insects such as mosquitoes, triatomines are very interesting because the, both males and females are obligatory hematophagous insects, in mosquitoes just females. So this is one difference that sets them apart from other blood um, feeding insects. And as we can see here on the lower right, there are many different, there are over 130 species of triatomines, and they present different distribution in uh, Middle and Central and South America. So, and in these areas, we, ecological field work, have identified triatomines that were widespread distributed. That means that they are found either at, in sylvatic areas, so in forest, in the tropical rainforest, like the Amazon, as well as in peridomestic and domestic areas. So this, some species, a limited number actually of species, are able to live in sylvatic areas as well as, the, as they present a highly a high degree of domiciliation. Yeah. In contrast, most of the most of triatomine species are actually sylvatic. This means that they are exclusively so far, we have only found them in sylvatic areas, associated very often to specific, to a limited number of um, palm trees, of palm trees, yes. However, it is important, and I think I cannot stress this enough, is that due to human destruction of natural habitats like the rainforest, what will certainly happen is that many sylvatic species will probably move to domestic and peridomestic areas. So for, for us, it was interesting to compare, okay, how are these, these two different, um, how are insects living in these two different um, habitats? Are they different? You know? And for this, we focus on one uh, genus, that is Rodnius, that it has been received in the past considerably attention because Rodnius prolysis at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century was kind of like a model for insect physiology. Uh, and it's a, this, it's a species that from an epidemiological standpoint is also very important and I, I think it presents a high degree of domiciliation and it's very often found in inside people's houses, on the roofs of people's houses. Um, in contrast, there are other species belonging to this genus that are only found in sylvatic areas. One of them, so I mentioned Robinus prolixus, and one of the sylvatic species that is very interesting is Robinus pretesi, because this insect species, this triatomine, is only found in one a palm tree species, that is Leopoldina piesava. So for us, it was an interesting idea to compare, to, to take these two species to compare um, how, how these species living in very different environments, if they present particular adaptations in the olfactory system, and as we will see later. But first, if we look at the habitat, no, the two different uh, um, environments in which these insects were found. For us, as we are highly visual organisms, we see that, okay, they look very different. But for, for us, as we work, work in the field of chemical ecology, we see also subtler differences between them. And this relates to other ones, yeah. So this, the differences between 
these two different environments is not just visual, it's also these two places smell probably different because of the vertebrates that are in this area, the vegetation that is present. And volatiles are extremely important for triatomines. As I said, these are nocturnal insects. So it's mainly heat and other cues that guide triatomine behavior. So mainly following uh, another plume secreted by, by their vertebrate hosts, these insects find them and later um, get their blood meal from them. So here I put, just for you as an example, I put three examples of how uh, we know that volatiles and others are important cues for these insects. So in one study some years ago, what they did was to use a T-shaped olfactometer that basically is a two, we have two arms, one with the other and one with solvent, yes, in which the other is diluted. And what they see in is in they put insects of rodents prolixus and they, these insects needed to make a choice. And they significantly, the insects significantly preferred more the arm that contained the other. Yeah. And the other was an extract from face. Yeah. So it contains like face volatiles. Interestingly, and this is something that is high research, is volatiles, the, many of the volatiles that we emanates uh, are actually not produced by ourselves, but our by our skin microflora. And this is seen very clearly here. So when people afterwards were using um, a gel that um, was killing the bacteria on the skin, um, a micro um, antiseptic gel, we see that this preference of the insects is gone. And only after 24 hours of washing their faces and the bacteria, only after the bacteria is recovered on the skin, the insects are again attracted to extracts from, uh, to these extracts. So this shows that Rodney's prolixus is attracted to host vertebrate volatiles, yes. Another example in tratoma infestants, um, tratoma infestants is, is present in north of Argentina, and it also presents also a high degree of domiciliation. And what they have seen, uh, what these researchers they have seen in the server sphere, so it's a, it's a ball in which the insect is able to freely move and orient towards another plume. They've seen that when they put lactic short chain carboxylic acids together with lactic acid, they see a significant attraction orientation of the insects toward this other plume. And this is further enhanced when they supplement this other plume with carbon dioxide. That is, it reaches levels, but the attraction leads to reaches levels that are indistinguishable from a um, mouse, from a live mouse. So again, we have the case where others are really important for, um, for these insects. And finally, uh, some people, some researchers have tried to design uh, traps in order to, that could be used for vacuum control, yeah. So at the moment, the World Health Organization recommends vector control as the way to control the spread of Chagas disease. So that's why it's so important to find, to understand how these insects react and detect tolerance. And what these research, researchers found is that when they use a synthetic blend of two acids and ammonia, they were able to trap uh, insects from rodents prolixus, yes. What this research show us is on one hand, um, triatomines are attracted to odorants, so this is a very useful, uh, it's a very important cue, sensory cue for them. On the other hand, most of the research that I've shown you now and that is published just focused on domiciliating species of, um, of triatomines. So there is a complete, almost complete lack of knowledge about what are the other cues that sylvatic species use. And this was a gating, was, our com was the compass in our research. So what, what we're trying to find was how triatomines have a different ecological niche, like I said, widespread distributed and sylvatic species, if these two different, if the 
these stratums detect others differently. Yes. And for this, we focus on two different species. Uh, as I said, I repeat it again, Rodney's prolixus, that is widespread distributed and presents a high degree of domiciliation, and the sylvatic species, Rodney's pretesi, yes, that is only found in the pine tree of the Inapia Sala. And since this was, uh, there's not so much known about sylvatic, uh, the refractory system of sylvatic specialists, we had to do some ground research to try to understand a li little bit how it was working. So that's why we compared um, morphologically and functionally the responses, the, uh, the peripheral factory system of these two species, also with the aim of identifying potential novel olfactory cues. So when we have a closer look at the insects, we see that the main, what we know is that the, the main olfactory organ of insects is the antenna that we see here, that we have is in, in triatomins, it consists of four segments, the escape, the pedicel, and the two flagellomers, one and two. And we did scanning electron microscopy in order to have a closer look at the antenna to see if there were differences already there in the antenna, because this might be that they have different sensilla expressed in it. And when we see here, when we have a closer look, we see these hairs that I just mentioned that are the sensilla. So this here that I hope you can see are the sensilla that are present in the, in this intratomins are present in the, just in the, the olfactory sensilla are present in the flagellum one and two. But as we see here, there are not many striking differences between both species. What is very interesting is that in the flagellum R2, we see like a pronounced difference within the flag flagellomer of the density of these hairs of this ancilla. Yes. If we have a closer look, we will see that some of these ancilla are mechanosensory, as we see here with the bristles. And then here we see the Campaniform ancilla that is also mechanosensory. And we also see some of the well known olfactory ancilla that is that are the basiconic sensilla, the tricot sensilla, that is also here, and the group back sensilla. And this we see both in Rodney's prolixus, and we see the same sensilla types in Rodney's pretesi, yes? And this, these structures, the sensilla, are the ones that are responsible for the detection of the aberrants. And very nicely, I think we see here, these groups were, or slits were um, usually are the pores through which the others um, um, that allow the passage of the others um, inside the, um, the sensilla. But mainly from this, what I want you to remember is that qualitatively, both Rodneus prolixus and Bretesi do not show any differences, yes, in terms of the external morphology. But then we asked, okay, it might be that the sensilla are expressed in different numbers in the, in the antenna. So this was based, this hypothesis was based on two, uh, actually I show you here two, but several um, pre previous work where they show that actually insects presenting a having, uh, having a, um, a larger habitat range have a higher um, sensilla density. This means that insects ha living in different environments, the same species living in different environments, usually they present a higher sensilla density. And on an, in another study, what they've seen is that taking parameters such as sensilla density and length and other um, since external morphology parameters that I'm not going to discuss into detail now, what they've seen is that they can cluster very nicely different species that we see here of triatomins. They, they cluster very nicely into the areas, the habitats in which they are usually found, yes. So it seems that the olfactory sensilla present in the antenna are very good indicators of the habitats in which these insects live. So that's why we thought, okay, how is the case 
what is causing in Rodney's Brutus and Rodney's Prolexus is they have different habitats. Is this, do we see any differences? We don't see any qualitative difference, but do we see any quantitative difference? And this, in order to do this, what we did was to do confocal, just autofluorescence confocal scan. And we counted the sensillum density in the second flagellomer, that is where most differences usually are found between the species. And we saw that while we don't see any difference from for the group pex and psyllium type, that we see uh, differences for, for two other types that are the trichot and the basiconic. With Rodney's bretesi, the sylvatic species presenting a higher density of sensilla in the antenna. So this is on regards to the external morphology of the the sensilla, the factory sensilla that are present in the antenna. Then we ask, are responses to the others different between the species? So do they detect these others differently? And for this, what we usually do in the lab, we have a very, it's a very well established technique that is called electroantenogram, in which what we basically do is we excise the antenna. So we cut the antenna and we place it in be between two electrodes. And we puff this antenna with different others. So we screen different others. And this probe, this EEG probe, is connected to a computer that in the end what we get are changes in voltage in response to the other stimuli. And we did this to a wide other panel in Rodney's prolixus. So this was done in Rodney's prolixus because we wanted to know which others are actually, as a first step, which others are detected by these insects, yes? Before, as I, I said to you, there are um, previous work mainly focused on responses to acids and some amines, but we wanted to know are there are other others or other volatiles or other other volatiles belonging to other chemical classes that are also relevant uh, for these insects, or at least that they can detect them. So that's why we did this electron sonogram for to a broad other panel consisting of different chemical classes and significant responses compared to the solvent are normalized to the solvent and compared to zero, sorry, are um, shown in the field bars. And what we see is that in addition to the acids, we do see responses to ketones, for instance, to well, as amines, esters. So we do see responses to other chemical classes. We see, interestingly, a response to a significant response to carbon dioxide for, from the antenna that this was not known. Where is how is our triatomines detecting carbon dioxide? So this was exciting. Um, but all in all, what this what this screening told us is that actually responses to acids are represent 45% of the total significant responses. So since the triatomines are highly tuned, at least in broader terms, uh, to, um, to acids. Yeah. And what we know about the detection of acids in insect is that the group Pexensilla that I mentioned before is, is mainly responsible for its detection, yes? So uh, if you remember, we were in the second flagell number, so it's the chick of antenna, and we see here the group Pexensilla that I introduced you before, yes? And this group Pexensilla, not only in triatomines, but in other I mean, in other insects was known that is uh, detecting um, acids and amines. And when we have a closer look at, here we have a, if, if we do, um, if we look inside this sensilla, sensillum, what we will see are different olfactory sensory neurons, yes? And these are the ones that are expressing the olfactory receptors that in the end are responsible for the detection of the others, yes? So our question was then, so we know that 
triatomines seem to be tuned to acids. We know that the group Pexensilla is responsible for the detection of acids. Do our group Pexensilla uh, group Pexensilla responses different between Rodney's prolixus and Pertesi? This was one now our question. And we are lucky in the lab because we are able to perform to use a technique that is called single acetylene recording in order to address this question. So here is how it looks like, the setup. So this is the microscope. Here comes the other. And here we have the tungsten electrode that we can see here in the diagram. So what we basically do is we put the insect under the microscope with a reference electrode in the abdomen. And then with that very fine tungsten electrode, we poke the olfactory sensilla the group pecs and sila in our case, yes? So we poke through the cuticle in order to record the electrical activity of the factory sensory neurons that are inside, yes? And this is a, an example, example of a response, how it looks like. So basically what happens is one after other presentation or upon other presentation, there's a change in the spiking frequency of these olfactory sensory neurons. In our case, we didn't, uh, we couldn't quantify, we don't know how many neurons there are inside the group Pexensilla, so we take the overall change in spiking frequency as a response. But a step before, in order to see if the group Pexensilla is responding to others, we first need the basic, the first step is to define which others are we going to use. I mean, I said that we screened before some others, in Rodney's prolixus, and this guided us on, on the design of a relevant or ecologically relevant other panel. But we wa it was very important for us also to choose others to screen the group Pexensilla that are probably found that are that insects are likely to find in their natural environments, either because they are emitted by vertebrates, but which are their hosts or are emitted by other triatomines, volatiles that are used in inter, in inter and intraspecific communication that have been previously described, that are emitted by plants, or that we included also other ones that are interesting for, that were interesting for us because of their effect in other blood cycling insects. As I said, we concentrated on acids, but we also used amines aldehydes, esters, and other uh, molecular classes as well, to have a, an overview of the responses and also to increase the likelihood that we see a difference between these two species, yeah. And this is how average response, responses from the group Pexensilla look like. So here we have our, the others that we screened and we quanti we quantify the responses, the average responses to each one of these elements, yes? And these are sorted according to the responses in, to run, in Rodney's prolixus. What we see is that the highest responses are for both species to propionic acid, that this is kind of expected, that we, we thought it would be an acid, the highest response. But another important difference, what we striking difference is that that we see here is that in general, since that Rodney's protesi is responding more strongly to other ones that Rodney's prolixus, yes. And this is further stressed when we sort the other ones according, we center the other ones to their highest response. And we see that in Rodney's prolixus, the, the number of other ones is much more limited to what to which we see stronger responses than Rodney's protesi, as shown by the lifetime sparseness. Sparseness, yes. So that basically measures the kurtosis here in this diagram. So it means that, in a way, Rodney's prolixus seems to be more narrowly, narrowly tuned than its sylvatic counterpart, yes. And in order to see major differences between these two species, what we, what we, an approach we took was to normalize our responses to propionic acid. That was the highest responding in both insects. And when we do this, some 
big significant differences remain uh, between the two species. But these are butyric chloride that I, um, as I mentioned, is a compound that is has an inhibitory that inhibits the carbon dioxide response in mosquitoes. We also saw differences to amyl acetate, that is a compound that is mainly found in, in, in plants, and trimethyl indole that is present in cattle as well as in inflorescences at low concentrations. And to a custom made uh, other plant, yes. So here we see that there are major differences between them, but there are also very specific differences between these two species. Other differences that we saw is in the response to the different chemical classes. So while Rodnius prolixus seems to be more tuned to amines, Rodnius recessive presents responses to broader responses uh, across chemical classes. And when we look at the, at the particular responses, so far I've I introduce only the average, average responses, but when we look at individual responses from the zincilla, we see that even within the, in, within the insect, not all zincilla responded the same, yes? And some patterns seem to appear, yes? And in order to, to visualize, to, to analyze the differences, what we did was to perform a cluster analysis in which we could identify for both species four different enzyme types, yes, in both uh, Rodnius prolixus and Rodnius pretensi. And what was important of this approach is that it al allowed us to see particular differences between these sensilum subtypes, yes. So we see that while uh, for instance, the group Paxansilum here in, in Rodnius, group Paxansilum 4 in Rodnius prolixus responds strongly to ammonia. The group Paxansilum doesn't respond to ammonia, but for instance, respond to ethyl 3 ethyl amine. So, this, and this, this was also seen in Rodnius bretesi. So, we, the same approach we have in. We did it in for Rodney's pretesis, so we have the group the um, subtypes for both Rodney's prolixus and Rodney's pretesi. And we see that they respond to different um to different um volatiles. That are it's interesting for us because and for other researchers because this could be used as diagnostic or in future research. Additionally, these sensilum types subtypes they differ in their responses to um uh, to the different chemical classes, yes? As we see here, for instance, while the group PEX and Silum 4 responds strongly to amines, the group PEC 2 responds more strongly to aldehydes. And the same, in a different way, it's true for Rodney's pretesi. So, lastly, what we what we saw was that um, okay, it seems to be there seems to be two types of two kinds of differences, not between broad difference between the two species, Rodnius prolixus and Rodnius protesi, and within this this group Paxansilla, there seems to be differences in their response profiles that are defined by the different group Paxansilum subtypes. So in order to visualize these differences, our question was, are the differences between the sensillum types bigger than between the insects? So in order to address, visualize this, what we did was a principal component analysis in which we can reduce the dimensionality of the data to two dimensions. So we took two principal components that explain 30% of the variance of the data. And what we see here is that actually, when we took the normalized responses, what we see is that the difference, the distances between the sensillum subtypes are actually bigger than between the insects, yes. 
And lastly, to conclude, uh, and to summary what I just presented, so we have seen that the sylvatic specially produced protesi present a higher degree of tricot and the basiconic sensilla. We haven't seen any difference in the density of the group like sensilla. However, we've seen that the species present functional differences. So the responses from the group like sensilla are different between the species because Rodneus protesi presents stronger responses to odorants than Rodneus prolixus as well there are differences in their, their response to specific odorants and they differ also on their responses to the different chemical classes. And this we see in the average responses as well as in the responses from each individual sensillum subtype. And we also identify a subset of others that can be used to identify um, group X sensillum subtypes. And based on this work, some, of course, some questions open up and that might be interesting to address in the future. So we've seen that there are different, bigger differences for some particular compounds like amyl acetate, and gold. It would be interesting to see if these, these differences are also reflected in behavior. Are, these, are the insects attracted or repelled by these compounds? Are there differences in this attraction or repulsion? Or, or repulsion? And um, it is also, um, it would be also interesting to characterize, to, to actually go to the field and see if the volatiles that we used here are actually present in the environment in which the sylvatic triatomans live. Because at the moment, there is a, a big lack of knowledge about what are the cues, the olfactory cues that these uh, insects use, the sylvatic species of triatomans use and orient their behavior. And with this, I would like to thank my supervisor, Silke, Richard, Rolf, and Bill Hanson for their encouragement and support, all current and past members of the department. And I would like to thank uh, the IMPRS and the Max Planck Society for funding and you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Florencia. That was an incredible presentation. Um, you obviously uh, showed us that not only the species differ in their morphology of their sensory equipment, but also in that functionality and also how this ties into their environment. And all importantly, when it comes to disease pro control programs, changes in that environment and how those two have that kind of very specific and basic science really ties in very rapidly to um, disease control programs and vector controlled in the field. Um, so thank you so much for that. I think the uh, audience really joins me in echoing all those thoughts. Chris Kim is saying thank you for your talk, very interesting topic. And certainly you've um, uh, given us much food for thought there. Um, Florencia and some questions coming in. But first, I suppose uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you, really, having seen this huge amount of work that you've done across electrophysiology, um, optical imaging technology, and the behavioral essays and so forth, um, and given the fact that you've got a huge amount of experience in this field, um, not just working on the triatomines, but also um, in the vinegar fly, the drosophilia Melanogaster. So my question would be, first and foremost, what about the technology? What, what, what are the challenges that you're facing or what would you love to see developed to kind of facilitate this work and take it to the next steps? I think, um, thank you for your kind words um, first. Um, I think when I started this project, I faced many different kind of challenges, no? I mean, luckily in insect science, um, and luckily I'm here at the Max Planck where we have access to a lot, like we are really lucky that we have access to a lot of techniques and we can freely use. But um, the problem is actually, is that there is not so much understanding what is happening back there at the in the sylvatic areas. I mean, we don't know really what are the, how these, are these insects living and how, what cues, and, and, it's, and I think 
I mean, there is some work there's, that I really admire from ecologists that go there in the field and trap the insects and they see the distribution. But we don't have behavior in their natural environment. So we don't know really how these insects are behaving. Are they just feeding on birds? Um, are they going, are they moving high distance and going to more domestic areas and then coming back to the to sylvatic areas? So I think this, and I think this is very important also for control methods to understand how is the behavior of these insects in the field and which sensory cues they are using. One interesting hypothesis from, from my work was, okay, why are sylvatic species responding more to others than domestic species? And we know that in domestic species, um, insects also guide themselves using heat. Yeah, so heat is an important cue that attracts these insects. We don't know in sylvatic species if they are also using heat to identify their vertebrate hosts. So this is something that needs to be addressed in future experiments. But again, it's extremely difficult. I mean, because some of these insects are living in nests high up there in pine trees, so it's very difficult to access them. Um, yes, so in that way, yeah, we are a bit limited to correlate what is happening in nature and what is happening in the lab. Also, I mean, we, I did some behavior with these insects and it's also very challenging. Um, and it would be interesting also, of course, in future experiments to do more behavior, for instance, with the others that I mentioned to see if they are responding to them, if they're attracted to them. Can we use these other as, are, others as traps or not and so these are this it is a technological challenge but it's also but not in terms of computers or machines i think <laughs> it is a much bigger challenge absolutely the magnitude of it is quite something um this kind of leads on nicely to a question here by derek robinson who's saying great talk thanks Given the choice between human and other mammals, what molecule pushes these in insects towards mammals? Sorry, towards humans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are, I think, some, what I read from studies where they measure, like they do analysis of the blood, of the blood meal in order to see if they fed on humans or if they fed on cows or in the fed. Some insects, they will feed on what is closer to them, no? Like some insects, they really nest on trees where they just feed on the bird that is also nesting in the tree. So there are really close association between this, between the host and the insect, yes? Uh, and another, and of course, I mean, when it comes to humans, I mean, we secrete volatiles, we secrete many acids that are also attractive to these insects. What we don't know, and I think I don't know if anyone know, if you give the choice of a human and you give the choice of a cow, I don't know what the insect will do. Um, but this, um, of course, can be studied, and then we, it could be an olfactory cue, of course, that we need to identify what is different between humans and, and other um, vertebrates as well. But we are speaking about, I mean, volatile skills that are there are over a thousand, according to some studies, of volatile skills. So it's it's not just one, I think. It's a combination of several ones. Got it. Thank you, Florencia. Another great question here from Stephen Bremer. What selection pressures on the peri-urban and urban species prevents them from invading the more abundant and odor-rich sylvatic environments? Uh, if I understood the question... I'll just pop it up on the screen. I suppose we've spoken right. a lot. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can only hypothesize about the selective pressures that is, that, that is acting on these insects. I mean, what happens in, in South America is that the insects that are in peridomistic areas 
in domestic areas, what used to happen is that they nest directly on on the roofs because they used to made out of straw that, and it was a very convenient place for the insects to nest because it's dark uh, and they can at night they just um, fold themselves in. In Spanish, actually, the word for triatomines is vinchucas because it means it's in Quechua and it means falling from the sky mm -hmm. because the insects literally would fall from the roofs to the people who are sleeping underneath. Um, so I can only imagine that for an insect, this is very convenient. I mean, you just need to fall down and you just immediately have a blood meal and you don't have any other predatory, ins uh, other uh, predators around you, you know? So it's a very safe, um, that ensures survival. Also, what happens is like around the peridomestic areas, the insects are also um, living there. I mean, I what happens, I mean, the selective pressure in domestic areas, um, and I think this is where the World Health Organization and your organization probably comes in, is vector control, you know? Like the insects, what the, the control for the vector control measure was to actively spray the houses with pesticides or use this kind of paints that are also um, toxic or repellent for the insects. Uh, so these kind of measurements actually killed all the insects that were living in domestic areas. Um, but also left this very nice environment free for other insects to come and colonize these these houses. Yes. So this is it's kind of a dynamic process, I think. So, but actively, what is killing these insects in the house? I think it's mainly human intervention of vector control, uh, vector control intervention. Fascinating. Um, you've got a lot of more questions coming in. <laughs> um, there's a great one here from Chris Kim, who's saying thank you for your talk. All the EAG information would be very useful to develop attractants for trapping the blood-sucking insects. Can you tell us a bit more about behavioral testing tools for the kissing bug? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that was mainly our long-term goal, actually. I mean, because we can screen the antenna fast, in a way fast, in, to see which other of these insects are detecting, no? And if they are detecting, like as we see for many of them, design traps. So um, in order to assess the behavior then to see if the trap, uh, eventual trap will actually work, there's different um, assays that have been used. One that it, the, the one that I presented to you, I didn't show a diagram, but it's like a two choice olfactometer in which when one arm you put a control and in that second other in the second in um, the other arm you put um, the other that you are interested in testing and then you put the insect in the middle and the insect needs to you give some time the insect to make a decision yes and then you see the preference you measure a preference index for the arm with the other another that it's in my hands at least seems to be more reliable is the server sphere in which the insect is able to freely move in a ball. Uh, and it's, it's, in, it's hold from a pin and it's able to rotate uh, inside the ball. And with this assay, you can set, measure the orientation towards the other plume. And it's important to consider with these insects that they are actually hygrotactic, so they are attracted to um, water vapor, yes, which is also very useful when, you are, <laughs> when your hosts are vertebrates. Um, and the and in this atmosphere, what you see is the orientation towards the the arm, the also the the other plume, you know, against the one containing the uh, water vapor. Yeah. So this would be like two of the main uh, assays used to assess behavior in tratomines. That's fantastic. That's a really uh, great answer. Thank you. Um, I think there was a question right at the beginning from Stephen Bremer, and this was actually something I was wondering when kind of preparing for the webinar. And uh, Florencia, could you tell us a bit more about what is known, if anything, about the disease ecology of triatomines in Africa? Another question by Stephen Bremer. No, I, I'm not an expert. 
Um, I mean, the African, if I'm probably someone else in the audience knows more than me, but the <laughs> sleeping sickness actually is also transmitted, um, is the, I think it's the African trypanosomiasis, but it's a different, I, as far as I know, um, the disease is only present, it's endemic in South America. I mean, there are triatomines that are present in other, um, in Asia, that have been also found in Asia, for instance. I don't know if in Africa they have been found. Um, but as their capacity for vectors of triatomines as vectors is only present in, in South America. What is interesting, of course, is because of human mobility. I mean, if there are triatomines in other places, like in Asia, as has been reported, um, and there's people having already the disease, sometimes they don't even know, this could also mean that the disease can start to be spread in, in Africa, in Asia, in other places as well. And this is, I think it changed in the last years because it, I think it, now it's routine, at least in Europe, I know that it's in routine to check in blood transfusions if they are positive for Chagas disease or not. And I think this also helps to contain the spread of the disease, uh, especially when it's like, yeah, it's vector bone and, but particularly about in Africa, I don't know any concrete cases of the disease being reported there or the presence of triatomines there. Yeah. Not that I'm an expert either, but I, on a kind of slightly uh, very short search, I also couldn't find any sort mm. of um, substantial information about this. So as Florencia said, if anyone in the audience, um, mm. oh. Mm. Yes, Derek Robinson, triatomides in Africa, yes, none transmit Chagas or other pathogens, as far as I know. Thank you for that. Thank you. And Derek actually was uh, raising a very good point and asking about um, what repels these insects. Repellents, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, one repellent that is, high, is frequently used in insects is DEET. It was identified by the military. Yeah, I guess you're familiar with it. And it's commercially used for repellency for mosquitoes. No, like the mechanisms of action is not very well known. But um, people, there is research published in tritomains, and this, unfortunately, is only repellent at very high concentrations. Um, so it's not very useful. I mean, there are other. I don't know the toxicity levels, but I can provide you with, uh, I think it was Claudia Lazari from Tours who, who assessed, and Paula, Paula Segmolio, who uh, assessed different uh, repellents against um, triatomines. However, I'm not so sure about the toxicity. And um, they're not, it's not like, limonene or like molecules that are naturally found. They were not molecules that were naturally found in the environment. So I think this maybe needs to be uh, determined if there are natural products that are also serve a repellent function in travel. Would be very nice. Yeah, would be nice. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. lots of discussions around DEET uh, in general, safe at the doses that we use, but always the quest for the next repellent is always on, so be yeah. great to watch this space. Um, Florencia, oh, Derek's just come back about deep, deep, yes, for biting flies, but I'm unsure for triatomines. Um, Derek meant any molecules that you've specifically found, which could actually happen. I mean, any of the ones that I identified that are detected by the insects, might be potential repellents. Actually, it's very interesting. One of the molecules that uh, I studied was isobutyric acid because it shows how important is the, actually the concentration of the odorant. Because there are studies, isobutyric acid is present also in human emanation, in vertebrate emanations, but it's also used by Rodneus prolixus as an alarm pheromone. So this is also having a, a, different concentrations have a different meaning to the insect. So it's not only, I mean, it could be that one of the molecules that we detected, that we identified at a different concentration also has a repellent action. But this, since I 
at this part of the project, I didn't do any behavior uh, with these molecules. I'm not so sure if, I cannot say if they will be repellent or not. I mean, this needs to be established. And as I said, probably at different concentrations because, uh, yeah, it has different effects. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, Florencia, this kind of brings us towards the end of our webinar. We're, uh, we, we're reaching um, three o'clock here, UK time. Oh, Derek Robinson saying great. Thanks for your comments. And um, lots of our attendees also saying thanks for sharing all this information. And um, also, I've included a link here on the chat if anybody would like to find out more about Florence's work in more detail, along with uh, the team, of course, at uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, there's a link there, and I can also just share right now um, uh, the document with you, the PDF of the PLOS NTDs paper, so you can download that directly. Uh, but in, for, in the meantime, for now, Florencia, I would just like to thank you very much. There's never quite enough time, and we definitely want to find out more about your next steps. If ever you do make it to the top of those palm trees, um, <laughs> let us know. And please do come back very soon. We'll be keeping an eye on this. And uh, again, a huge thank you to you and the whole team involved for this incredible research and for taking the time to share that with us. Thank you. No, I would like to thank you for all the work that you're doing, really. It's really so important to really spread knowledge about uh, neglected tropical diseases and create awareness. So. Absolutely. Yeah. We're 100% with you on that. Absolutely. It's very close to our hearts. And um, also a big thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Uh, some great questions from Stephen Bremer, Derek Robinson, Chris Kim, also Robert Clay. Thank you. And hello, Kree Seng Chorn, uh, Professor Chuen Chuente, many, many more, Louise Kelly Hope. So lots of people who joined us today. I can't name everyone, but um, Dr. Haluskova saying very nice presentation from speaking from France. So to everyone who participated today, lovely to see you all. Thank you very much. And um, let's keep in touch.